Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me uh, on today's episode of Tell the Others. I'm excited to be joined by a fellow therapist and colleague of mine and friend of mine, Tom. Hello, Tom. Hello, Heidi. How are you? Yeah, good. Nice to see you on the screen. Yes. Instead too. of in person. Yes. <laughs> um, so Tom is joining us today because I wanted to pick his brain a little bit on this whole concept of self-healing. Uh, I know that Tom has done his own sort of journey and his own path with that. And uh, he reads a lot. And uh, I know that you would be an interesting sort of um, voice to lend your opinion on what self-healing means and and does it work and why is it important and all that jazz. Um, I guess we'll start with, so the concept of self-healing, do you subscribe to it? You know, do you think... Yep. You know, and then maybe if you want to also share a little bit about when did you kind of have an epiphany of like, I think I need some healing to do. Like, I think there's stuff that's not working in my life and I want to explore working on myself and personal development. Like, yeah. So if you could share a little bit about your opinion on self-healing and then what your journey has been. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, well, yeah, I absolutely subscribe to, um, you know, the art of self-healing um, as an art form, which I, you know, you and I were discussing that um, before uh, we press record. I think that's a great way of describing it. You know, um, healing and um, therapy has a lot of baggage to it. You know, you feel like despite how much social change, you know, we can all try to implement, it still feels like, oh, I'm broken. I need to go somewhere because I'm broken and an A, B and C, you know, but it's so much more than that. And when you start to describe it as an art form, it's, it becomes something, it becomes, you know, not so much about healing, even though that is what you're doing, but you also become, um, it becomes about self-expression because art mm -hmm. is all about self-expression. And I think at the end of the day, if you're thriving in life, there's a very strong, unique element to that. You know, I'm expressing myself authentically. I'm, I get one shot at life, you know, um, something that I always try to remember in my head, in my head, because I've only got one is, um, I don't remember, um, for better or for worse, the names of my great grandparents. So three generations, Tom Ahern is kind of non-existent really, unless you add, you know, if you go out there and try to find me. Um, so I, I really get one life here. So the art of self-healing is, is also the art of self-expression. They're almost kind of the same thing, but so I absolutely just subscribe to that. And for me, um, like with, with most people, I, I believe on the path, um, I, um, I got to a place where I really had to start listening. Um, it w I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder in 2014. It is something that I, that I still manage, um, um, day to day. Um, it's far better than it was. And I, it's, it's become, um, part of something that I enjoy about myself now. So it's not so much a thing of, this is a difficulty that I just have to lug with me like a big Santa sack every day or, or a rock chain mm -hmm. to my leg. But it's, it's, um, it's, it's something that also gives me lots of other things that I really quite like about myself. So that that's, um, that's me, but you know, I was very rigid in my thinking. Um, I was, implicitly aware of, you know, I don't think I could explicitly tell anyone at the time, but for, throughout my whole life. Um, and then in, in, in the late years of 2013, I started to just get very intrusive thoughts about harming all sorts of people, um, harming young children, doing terrible things to young children, terrible things to animals, violently sexual, um, intrusive thoughts about friends and family members, um, and I had no idea where it came from. And there was a lot of shame tied into all of that because mm -hmm. I didn't really have a relationship with my mind at that time. So like with all of us, when we begin, I've kind of thought um, that my thoughts were who I was, you know, and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm sadistic, masochistic. Um, mm -hmm. I'm something's um, wrong with me. Something's mm -hmm. wrong with me. Yeah. Something, mm -hmm. and something's really, really wrong with mm. me. And, um, and, uh, you know, as, as the path would go, I, I spoke to a therapist in the beginning and I, that was the first time I'd really, you know, embodied the fact that, Hey, I need some help here. And when you kind mm -hmm. of do that, Pandora's box opens and it was worse <laughs> mm -hmm. in the beginning. Cause I'm like, I'm fine. I'm finally looking at this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, 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 um, it was very interesting moving away from sickness to health. I, and started to learn more about the mind and it became just the most 
I mean, the irony of it was it became an obsession, you know, but it was wonderful. I could mm -hmm. not stop reading. And this was someone who um, never read at school, wasn't very good at school because school's so narrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hadn't really found my lane um, mm -hmm. because how can you find a lane when there's only one lane? <laughs> Totally. I remember yeah. thinking I wasn't a reader or that I just didn't, I would like, I would describe myself as that, like, I'm not really a reader. Yep. And then when I discovered, you know, psychology and self-help books in my early twenties, I was like, where have these books been? Like, yes. I can plow through these books. I don't yes. care about history and English and literature, but like these ones, like I can't put them down. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. I couldn't agree with him more. It was just wonderful. And I just, every time I pick up a book and you know, I'd learned something more of it. And in the beginning, it was all about reading about OCD, you know, because mm -hmm. that's, that was me, you know, I just, mm -hmm. I, I, I needed that label, I think, in the beginning, because it reassured me, but I was very much identified with it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I would read and, and read, and then it became about other things as well. I think one of the things about trauma, which I really like is, because um, people often ask, they say, you know, when do I consider myself healed, you know? Mm. Um, it's so it's a paradox in my opinion anyway because if it's an art form then it's constantly expressing yourself more and more authentically as the years go by evolving so evolving that's exactly right so it, it never stops but at the same time if the specific trauma becomes almost like a bit of a boring story and you're 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 interested in other people other people's stories as well now that's an exciting time for you too because now it's about expanding beyond the pain mm -hmm. of what brought mm -hmm. you into this world. So, so long story short, um, absolutely subscribe to the art of self healing. And 2014 was when things changed for me. Mm, wow. And then, okay. So you started out with therapy and I think that's most people, I could be making a generalization, but I feel like mm. most people when they go, Oh, what's going on in my head? Yes. Or, you know, for me, it was being suicidal and depressed in my early twenties. And that's when I was like, I think I'm going to die. And so if I don't go see someone, that might actually happen. Yeah. Um, but what I learned then was I didn't actually want to die. I wanted the pain to stop. Mm. And I didn't know another escape hatch. I didn't know another way out. And I, I often will say that to clients, like, can we just be clear? Are you feeling like in this room, there's no windows, there's no, no doors, and you don't know a way out of the pain. But then you look up in the corner and you see this little escape hatch and it says, you know, like, death, killing myself. And your brain is like, yes, that's the answer. And a lot of times people will say, not a lot of times, most of the time people will say, yeah, that's what I want. I want that escape hatch. Where's the escape hatch? Where do I make this pain stop? Where do I turn it off? I don't actually want to die, but if you could turn the pain off, then I would sign up for that, you know? Mm. And the brain, unfortunately, when it is in a lot of pain, it's like, dude, death is a great option because then yes. it makes the pain stop. So um, so I, I, I hear you on that of having a, it's pain. I think that always drives us to wanting to change and wanting to get help. Yeah. Um, for me, that then was therapy and starting with a therapist and it was great. I think your for, your first sort of dance and therapy is awesome. Cause it's like, oh my God, what is this? And you're thinking about your childhood and you're thinking about your parents and you're thinking about mm. all these things that you're like, I never thought about that. Like, <laughs> The number of times that clients will say to me, I never thought about it. I never thought about it that way. I never looked at it that way. Yes. And it's like, this is what's cool about a therapist. And what's cool about therapy is that it just like, ooh, like shows you different sides of things that you've never seen, mm. but mm. it's limited mm. and it's one hour a week or one hour a fortnight, which in the scheme of life is nothing. That is a drop in the ocean. I always say there's 168 hours in the week. You're joking yourself if you think that one out of 168 is going to like yes. magically transform you or your kid. Like we're good, but like I'm not that good, you know, like <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not a magic like miracle <laughs> worker. So I think when you realize that like, OK, so if I'm looking at 168 hours, what else am I doing to promote healing and growth and stuff, you know, besides mm. therapy? Um, so for me, same to you, I guess that it was therapy and then reading and discovering. I like books that, you know, were about psych and about, you know, childhood and, you know, feelings and things that I just, I didn't know anything about. Mm. And then what happened? So, so you, you have your first sort of dance and therapy, you get the OCD diagnosis, then you start reading books and then what, what was the next sort of cab off the rank for healing? Yeah. So I, um, 
um, I'm trying to think. So it was therapy. And to be honest with you, therapy, therapy was good. Um, but I was also lucky because around that time, podcasts were, were booming. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're booming now still, um, and they will continue to boom. But mm. I, it was the first time I'd really started, started to listen to, wow, there's a free education resource out there. And, and all these people talk about all these different little niche topics and I can start learning about all sorts of things, you know, I mm -hmm. could just go for it. So I remember, I, you know, I would clean my room on a Sunday, um, when I was living with dad and just put a three hour podcast on about, mm -hmm. um, ancient Mayans, <laughs> you know, and, and I was just, was like, oh, this is weird. I never learned this at school. I learned about Pythagoras theory. I've never used that funnily enough. Mm -hmm. I swear though, you know, my teachers told me I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they said, Hey, you this should. calculator is really important. Buy this calculator. <laughs> and then the phone came along. <laughs> so, so I don't know, but uh, oh they were convincing, but um, mm. yeah. So I started to, to listen to, to other people. I think the, the change for me at that time was I can't believe there's so much about myself. I don't know. Like, that's really strange to me, you know, because I'm Tom, like I know myself, I should know myself. And then I'm speaking to someone and getting all these different ideas and things. Um, and, uh, and, uh, there's so much I don't know about me and how do these mm. other people know more about me? That's weird, you know? So, so this is, this is strange. And I think I, sh I should backtrack as well. One of the major, um, experiences that happened to me, probably the most significant experience that has ever happened to me, which is a big statement to make was, mm. um, I, I had a lot of, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, um, on Thursday night of the week of schoolies when in 2011, when I was 18 and it completely blew my perception of myself. And, um, it was harrowing to say the least. It wasn't quite good. I didn't really have an ego that was formed at the time anyway to demolish. So that was a lot. <laughs> wow. But that was always in the back of my mind as well. I just, I'd felt like by the time I was 2000, it was 2014 and I would built myself back to, I'm a VFL player. I'm going to make the AFL one day. This is who I mm -hmm. am. Then all the girls will like me. Then I'll have all the money. You know, that'll be the place mm -hmm. that my self worth will finally be attained. You know, and mm -hmm. in the back of my mind, I was also thinking, well, there was this very traumatizing experience that happened to me that I still have no idea what the hell went on, and I never quite felt like I was standing on solid ground. So I was also very interested in introspection at that time because I could have, I didn't really have a choice. It, mm -hmm. it blew me down so far to the point where I, I really was struggling to come to terms with reality because my mm -hmm. sense of self and reality had been shaken to such a degree. And that. because of the mushrooms, are you saying because that, so, yeah. so you're not really selling mushrooms to me. I've never done mushrooms, but no. like <laughs> that experience is sounding. And for you to use the word harrowing yes, makes me go, Oh my God, like that sounds really traumatic. And after watching the um, Netflix special on Change yes. Your Mind and all about psychedelics and how amazing they are, um, I'm kind of freaked out by mushrooms. And it sounds yes. like, but I guess that's the thing, right, isn't it, with mushrooms and lots of drugs is that it's like you could go either way, you know. Well, you, you can go either way, but I mean, I was also dumb because, and I'll put my hand up for that, is I, I did far too many, eight to nine grams um, right. in, a, in, a, in a setting that was, um, unfamiliar, not with a trained oh, clinician who could support okay. me. Okay, got it. And and one of the worst things that happened is the experience came on so strong because I'd never had these types of mushrooms before up in Byron Bay, mm. and I was in a group. It was me and a friend, and I was in a group full of um, drunk boy party animals who were looking at me doing this with a light switch, going, "Hey, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you seeing? What are you seeing?" For like hours, so it was really bad. So, so mushrooms are a very powerful tool. Um, and you, <laughs> that's not the right way to do it. That's not the right, that is the wrong way. <laughs> that is the wrong way to do it. But that in is the same the, way as, yeah. you know, if you, if you walk into a gym, um, and someone says, Hey, let's see if you can squat 400 today and you can't, and you have a broken <laughs> leg. It's like, no, nah, let's probably not do that. You know, let's yeah. get you on a bike and, yeah. you know, so <laughs> that, yeah. that's the same thing with it. So mushrooms, I should say that it wasn't the mushrooms. It was how I approached the experience. I was doing Got it. it. Party. Okay. So we won't blame the mushrooms. We'll no. bring, we'll blame the environment and the, the whole context of the whole experience. Got it. You okay. can blame me. I think that's, that's <laughs> okay. So yes. you have this, this mushroom trip from hell. 
Yes. And that then what? It makes you go like, oh my God, I don't know myself or oh my God, what's the purpose of life? Like what was the, if you had to like put it in a sentence, you know, it's like, I'm not safe. I'm unlovable. Like what was, how did your brain process that experience then? So basically I, I thought I was always bordering on psychosis Got every it. day. So I didn't really, I could not, um, I never really felt right in reality, you know, because yes. I knew there was this thing in me that could take me to that place again. Um, I uh, should also say that so like, sorry, the mushrooms. Okay. Sure. So I just got it. The mushrooms showed you a side of yourself that we all have within us, but the mushrooms were like a floodlight totally illuminated. Like, what would you call it? Like your shadow self, the dark, the dragon, you know, like your dark side or whatever showed yeah. you this whole side that we all have within. But I think all of us are like experts at keeping it like hidden, buried yes. away, pretending we're it doesn't exist. It. Yeah. <laughs> but you were just like, and here it is. Exactly. And then your brain was sort of like, Oh my God, if you go down that hallway again, it's going to end up at the last chamber, which is where the dragon is. Yes. Don't go in the hallway. Is that right? Exactly. That's Got exactly it. Okay. right. So, so there's a, there's a great quote um, from Carl Jung and he says, be careful of unearned wisdom. And that was a very, very um, important quote for me to read because he he's the one that came up with this kind of shadow aspect of the self kind of um, like mapping the mind, you know, with all these different aspects of it. And, you know, taking that many mushrooms will get you right down to the bottom of what 10 years of therapy will give you. Yeah. But I hadn't done the work to be yes. able to hold space for that place. Got it. So, Got it. So when I'm doing therapy and I'm working slowly taking layers off Pandora's box in 2014, yeah, yeah. in the back of my mind, I know there's some shit that's fucking all the way down there, you know, and I'm mm. terrified because mm. I'm like, yeah, cool. These are, this is good. CBT. Mm -hmm. Hey, amazing. Mm. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then I'm like, well, hang on. There's some, there's some stuff going on down there. So I gradually developed the, um, the, the confidence to, um, do a float tank you know, or start to listening to myself in silence with meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always very interested coming back to the podcast, um, always very interested in talking, hearing about people's other experiences with psychedelics or solitude, or, I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a, a chemical, but any kind of place that got them to these very deep places, mm -hmm. because I knew that was in me. Um, and I was terrified mm -hmm. of it for so long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wow. Okay. And I think podcasts are a really great point to bring up because there's so many out there. There's so many different topics out there that if you grew up in a small rural town in Texas and all that you've ever been exposed to is X, yes. or you grew up on the streets of New York or, you know, the streets of Paris or Japan, wherever you mm. grew up, you only kind of know what's around what's in your neighborhood what your parents say what's your what your friends say what's in your environment and podcasts mm -hmm. i think and like youtube i guess you could say as well is like this buffet of totally different experiences i mean and you're literally you're being exposed to people that you would never normally meet in your little bubble of you know white suburbia or whatever you know yeah, wherever yeah. you live you're sure. you're getting exposed to all of this different stuff so Okay, so pod, so it was therapy, books, podcasts. Yep. And yep. then and then what did you was it just sort of deep diving into all of those and and cuz I'm trying to think about myself if I would mm. say therapy books what I would say beyond that yoga, meditation, journaling. Yeah. But then I think it's like once I sort mm. of figured out the stuff that works for me, EMDR, mm. somatic experiencing, Peter Levine stuff. When I started doing all of that stuff, I think it's like I, I then just have sat in that for a bit. And then it's just like going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, but using those as the tools. So yeah, is that what, what it was for you was sort of sitting and then going deeper and deeper, and deeper, or did you then do other things to heal and learn and grow and evolve? Yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, one of the, the major catalysts for continued self-growth has been my relationship. So, um, mm. you know, I met my partner um, in 2016 and we, um, so, so 2016 for me, that was two years after therapy. I was, I was um, um, competing in CrossFit. So I'd still 
found some way to express that energy, um, mm -hmm. which is now jujitsu. Um, mm -hmm. And I was feeling pretty good about myself. Like I was, I was happy. I was a coach. I was doing okay. And then, um, and then um, we fell in love. But what was really interesting was um, my partner's, her visa was expiring. Um, so she had a job lined up in New York and it was kind of like, if you want this relationship <clears throat> to work, we have to put $11,000 down for a visa and legal fees. We need to move in together. We need to basically fake that we'd be moving in together for, and we'd been together for a year. We just mm. have to just put the relationship like on the express path to two, mm -hmm. three years down the track. So, so much resistance. So then all our shit came up. So her mm -hmm. stuff from her past is coming up. My stuff can, is all coming up and, and we're just triggering the shit out of each other constantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of what, that's the, the pain and beauty in relationships is we, we tend to seek familiarity. So I'm, all my stuff's coming up. So, but just, but looking back on that, what a wonderful way to grow and, and, and grow with someone, you know, and, and merge, um, and, and our relationship hasn't had, it's not like it didn't have challenges thereafter, but it was always, I think one of the things I really took from, from that was if I start to see life as a giant classroom, then I've got opportunities in those pain, painful moments and challenges to grow and learn more about who I am as an individual, because every time I'd expose myself to pain and challenge by myself, mm. it had always led to some sort of lesson that was really, really good. Um, I didn't know anything about that when I'd done mushrooms or when I went to therapy and, you know, it was like, what am I trying to learn here? What's the, what's the, the integration from this experience? I've got the awareness now, Hey, mushrooms, what, what's the self? That was a big mm -hmm. one. <laughs> um, I wasn't ready for that. At 18. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> that was a big one. What yeah. is the self? Oh my Lord. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't fun. Um, seeing myself extrapolated in like three different zones and seeing myself swimming in a pool of the front cover of Red Hot Chili Peppers, looking up at myself terrified at the same time. It was a lot. It was a lot. Ow. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. Good. But um, doing doing couples counseling was, was fantastic because it was a way for us to to both grow based upon, you know, we, we'd burn the boats on, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd you know, we'd um, gone out to the island and burned the boats because we put all this money down for the race. There was no turning back. Mm -hmm. um, so we attached ourselves I love ourselves that analogy. To, I love it's that It's a great analogy. one, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, yep. you, you have to make it work or you die, you know. Yep. I didn't have 11 grand. <laughs> yeah. Um, so That's so what I, I felt when I moved to Australia was um, I had like, I don't know, 600 bucks in my bank account. And I was like, I'm burning the boats. Yep. I'm just going and I'm going to yeah, burn that. the boats and I'll figure it out. Yep. And you always do. You know, you leap do. in the net will appear. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Leap in the net will appear. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was um, yeah. So sorry. Design. So then what? So then you guys are are doing healing and stuff in the relationship and and growing and stuff. Yeah, because uh, we had no no choice. I think really, like we we really wanted to make the relationship work. Um, and there were lots of times when we, when we both doubted it and lots of big arguments and, and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly don't want to paint an image as though it was, and then it was wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but it became very meaningful. I think that's an important <clears throat> distinction, you know, um, happiness and, and meaning. Uh, um, I think there's an important distinction to be made there because, you know, I can look on my, my relationship now um, and just with what we've been through um, and go, wow, we've really made it into something that we're both very proud of, you know, and you can do that, whether you're with someone or not, um, you know, if you look back on something and you know the the difficulties and the elation and the and the the challenges, and you go, it might just be a belt around my waist, but it's uh, it represents something that that no one can take away from me, you know. And that was that was very healing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point you just made. It represents something that no one can take away from me. I often will say that to clients when they'll go. Um, like they get well and they're not depressed anymore. They're not as anxious anymore or whatever. And then they'll go, I'm afraid that it's going to come back. What if it comes back one day? And I'm always like, dude, you, that's impossible because that would involve unlearning mm. everything you've learned over the last few years in our time together. And that's like impossible. You can't mm. unlearn. It's like, you can't unsee stuff, you know? Yes. And so even if you did have an experience or, whatever happens in the future and you find yourself in a really dark 
place or, you know, another dark night of the soul and you're going through stuff again, you still will never be as rookie and not numb, blind, naive, ignorant of all of these things that you were when we first started together, Mm. because you've learned all of these things. You've unpacked your themes, you've unpacked your patterns, you've unpacked your childhood stuff. Like, and then, so if you do a second piece of work around whatever your depression or anxiety, you've covered stuff that is, you've already done it. So it's like, you can't, you can't forget. You can't, I think I I get that. Cause I remember feeling that when I left my first therapist mm. say, and when I moved to Australia and <laughs> saying, um, yeah, I'm afraid my depression is going to come back or I'm going to get into an abusive relationship again, or, yep. um, I'm going to have, you know, friendship trauma like I had then, you know, cause I have a lot of friendship trauma, relationship trauma stuff. And so mm. I was like, that's going to happen again. And she was like, no, 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 no. She's like, Heidi, you're self aware now, but also you're hyper aware Mm. of people and relationships and how they make you feel and how you're showing up in the relationship. And, um, no, that is not going to happen again. Mm. And she was right. And, you know, here I am 20 years later from that first round of therapy and she's absolutely right. It's, it's made me be, yeah, I can't unlearn it. Um, And I think that is one of the things that I love too about self-healing is when you're doing it yourself, it's like no one can take that away from you. And I always say to clients, like when they're like, thank you so much. And you changed my life. And like, I, it's like, thank you. That's nice. But I'm like, to me, I'm just, I sat alongside you. Mm. I'm just a fellow traveler, dude. Like (laughs) I'm just a fellow traveler. Like I am not above or below. Like we are all equals my, the way I view it is we are both walking along together and we were just walking along together for a period of time, Mm -hmm. weekly, fortnightly, whatever. And just talking about this crazy thing called life. And I have some ideas that I can share with you about, you know, polyvagal theory or whatever, but like really we're just fellow travelers walking along. And I always say like, I just showed up to our sessions I didn't do all of the hard work. You did the hard work. Yeah. You have to go to sleep with yourself at night. You have to get up and go to work. You have to do the journaling. You have to do the yoga. You have to do the breath work. You have to do the meditation. I just sit there and we, you know, in my mind, I'm like, we just shoot the shit, you know, yeah, for an true. hour a week or whatever. So it's true. it's true. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that whole, like, am I going to lose it? You know? And it's like, that's not self-healing. Like you mm-hmm. can't lose it. It's just, you can't go back. You can't go back. You know, butterfly, I always say butterfly can't go back to being a caterpillar. And that's what we've done in our therapy together is you went from caterpillar to butterfly. It's just, it's like impossible. You can't go back. You might be a sad butterfly, but like, you're never going to go back to how the sadness that you felt in your depression with the caterpillar life, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, um, I remember an intrusive thought I had once, um, which was, God, I'm really worried about what it would feel like to not be anxious. (laughs) Wow. I still remember that. I still remember that, you know, and I think to use your analogy, I was coming out of the chrysalis. So I wasn't a butterfly yet. And I think that kind of what if I go back is still at that place when you're when you're starting to spread your wings. Mm-hmm. Um, because I also think that you know that once you're when you really know that you're a butterfly, to to view yourself as a caterpillar once again is very hard. You know, it's very hard to see. It's very hard for me to see myself um, and I'm not different to anyone else, you know, um, as this this very scared young man, um, Mm. all the compulsions, all the rigid ways of thinking. It's very hard for me to to even think about what that person would think of himself in the world because I'm so not that person anymore. And I think that worry of what if I go back is still at that place when you haven't truly embodied the... um, the, the butterfly, which is totally fine. It just means that, you know, and I hope for me, for myself, in comparison to who I'm going to become in five years, 10 years time, I'm a caterpillar now. Mm-hmm. So it is, as you said, the word evolving is always, mm-hmm. it's always happening. We're always, I mean, it's the only constant is change, obviously. So always, but I also think with, with healing, it's the, it's the first evolution. And it's the, it's the, when you get to the other side, it's the, well, now I recognize that I'm always in a place of change. So it helps you with being more open-minded. And at the end of the day, dysfunction in the mind is, is to a degree, you don't want to be too general, of course, but a lot of it is down to rigid thinking. You know, it's, I'm a, or 
I'll never be a, or whatever it is. And if you can become more open-minded to the, well, who the hell am I? You know, I wasn't ready for that lesson, but mm -hmm. <laughs> now I'm starting to just tackle with it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that can can lead to, to a wonderful place. There's a, a, lovely, a lovely quote um, by Joe Campbell. Um, the psychotic drowns in the same waters within which the mystic swims with delight. And mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing. It's kind of like reality around me hasn't changed, but I don't feel as, you know, this is a 1950s book, I think it was. So psychotic's very, you know, but if you've got that rigid thinking, you're, you're in the same place that some wonderful shaman, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the Amazon exists in now. It's just their, their capacity to see the forest mm -hmm. from the trees is, is, is much more kind of enlightened, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That's um, what I think is so hard, though, with with trying to sort of explain this to people when I say, like, you can heal yourself and you can learn. There's just like some basic tools, some basic concepts, philosophies and things that you can learn. And then you can you can heal yourself because I believe the body's capable. I believe the mm -hmm. brain is capable of healing itself. Like, hello, you get a cut. Like, we know this. You get a cut on your hand and I don't sit there and go heal go white blood cells, go, you know, go clotting blood scab. Yeah. You know, I don't, I just go, my body knows what to do. My body's going to heal itself. You take a chunk out of my liver, same thing. Mm -hmm. My body knows what to do. It'll regenerate. Um, the brain, I think the mind, the wounds that we carry, you know, on a soul level or whatever, I think is the same that the body wants to heal. The brain wants to heal. The brain doesn't want to sit in a place of suffering, totally. but what I find so hard is trying to convince people of that Yes. when they are a caterpillar and I'm like, hey, 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 there's, the, you know, they're, and they're talking about, I just wish I could fly. I wish I could fly. And I'm like, you can mm -hmm. come with me. I know, I know the way it's just, it's just down here. Yeah. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some money. It's going to take some effort, but I know the way come, 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 come. And they're like, no, it's just a caterpillar's life for me. And yes. I'm just always going to be on the ground. And, and I'm like, but, but look, I, I have wings yeah. See, and, and this guy has wings. <clears throat> and so it's like, if, if we can have wings, surely it can't just be us. Like surely yes. there, there's gotta be a, like a, a method to this that, yes. that you could also get wings. Like, why do I, why am I the only one that's allowed wings? Why can't you mm -hmm. learn to fly too? And I want to just, I don't know. It's like, I get so frustrated sometimes when people are like, oh, that's cute for you. Or yeah. Heidi, you come from a place of privilege or um, yeah. I don't have the time or the money to devote to that. And I just, I want to be like, there's such a beautiful life out there. Mm. There is so much cool stuff. You don't have to feel this pain. You don't have to live with the suffering. And I think when I was in that caterpillar hell and feeling um, hopeless and wanting to die and I had no worth and I had no value, I remember my therapist, you know, showing me her wings and saying like, yeah. dude, you can totally fly. And I was like, you're nuts. Like that <laughs> can maybe be for other people, but that's not for me. And I'm, I'm just like, God, how do we, and I guess for me, that's what Tash, the art of self-healing, the, the program that I've built is I'm trying to, to take everything I've learned and everything I know academically and, you know, professionally, but then also from my personal experience of like, mm -hmm. this is what I've learned in the last 20 years of how you do it, how you go from butterfly or how you go from caterpillar to butterfly. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it exists. It's, yeah. you can do this, but just to get people to believe that butterflies exist to mm. get them to believe that becoming a butterfly is possible for them. That's the piece that I'm like, how do you do that? And the only, yeah. the only thing I've come up with of how you do that is flying in front of people and going, see, I'm flying and see that guy, he's flying totally. and she's flying. And so it's like, surely you can't be the unicorn and you're the only one that can't do it. And all these other people can, you know, like yes. give it a shot, you know, like, I don't know. That's my, best guess of how to explain that it's possible yeah. what would what's your way of explaining like that healing is possible for everyone i think it is that too and and there's a there's a reason why i think um so i think our world is is wonderful in many ways but i think when you live in an in an ecosystem and you're surrounded by people who are busy all the time stressed all the time um anxiety and depression are very normal you know mm. it's very hard to see what's not normal, which is happy, healthy, the butterfly thriving. Yeah. And this, I remember a Ted talk about a young um, gay man and he was, he would have been kind of 15, 16 at the time. And when he was growing up, the only gay people that he saw were very, very camp men like that fellow in, um, 
in uh, Mean Girls. I love that movie. Mm, um, I mm-hmm. can't remember. Um, I can't yeah, remember. yeah. He says some sort I know of what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but for him, that wasn't <laughs> his idea of being gay. You know, his mm-hmm. idea of being gay was something else. You know, it was owned him. And when, when, when he started to see a person that, you know, embodied a lot of the qualities of being gay um, was for him, he was able to see, oh, there's a place for me now. I can, I, this is who I can become. There's a, there's a, there's a much more um, uh, authentic vision that I have for my life now, because at the time it was like, well, if I'm gay, well, then I suppose I have to do this and, and, yes. and be all, all this sort of stuff, mm-hmm. you know? So I think it is that thing. If you start seeing other people that are doing it, that you resonate with. So there mm-hmm. is an important association with empathy there. Hey, I get it because as you said, beyond my academia and professional experience, I mm. was you. I legitimately was you, and now I'm not. And I don't. And 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 I'm excited to to show you the path. I'm just a little mm. bit higher up here on this mountain. Mm. I was there. I was on that bottom path as well. Mm. Let me tell you, the view is amazing up here. It wasn't that good down there. I remember it, you mm-hmm. know. But it, it won't be like that forever. And mm-hmm. I think um, it's kind of like that for me. It's very hard. It's like. It's, isn't that, do you not feel like that's the question that we as therapists are always asking, like, what's the thing that's going to get people to make that psychological shift into maybe that's me too. Mm-hmm. Mm. But, uh, oh, dude, I think it's just repetition and where people start to see little changes in therapy where we might set a little goal of like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, So say like for a recovering people pleaser, when my food order comes out wrong, I'm going to say to the waitress, um, excuse me, I I think they got my order wrong and I'm going to start there. And then they do Mm -hmm. something like that. They tackle something like that. And they're like, oh my God, I did it. It wasn't, it was scary, but like I got through it and it felt so good afterwards to eat the right meal, you know, (laughs) and then I graduated up to confronting my mom and saying, I don't want you to come over unannounced anymore, you know? Mm. And it's like, you, you start to do these little things or seemingly little things, uh, little changes, little tweaks. Yep. And then you realize in time, I think it's like you build on top of those to then go, I can do the big, I can do the big stuff. I remember I had a client once who, um, he had, uh, couch surfers come and stay at his house all the time. Um, and, he always had a, a two night min, um, maximum. It was, it was always like two nights. Cause then if they're horrible, they're gone and it's, you know, not a big deal, but oftentimes people, cause he had a hard time with boundaries. Oftentimes people would be like, your place is so great. Can I stay an extra night? And he would always do it reluctantly. And then he would get bitter and resentful. And it was just really frustrating. And it was so interesting because he finally worked up the courage to say to one of the backpackers, you know, sorry, no, it, it, it is a two night maximum policy. Uh, so you, you will need to leave, you know, tonight. That is the last night. And she pushed back and he was firm with it. And it was so interesting because that one act of standing up for myself and advocating for myself was then this, like literally like an intersection where he turned left for the first time after his whole life turning right, 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 right. He turned left. And then the catalyst of that eventually led to him disclosing to his parents that he had been abused by a family member when he was little, which he had been holding his whole life because he didn't want to disappoint them and upset them. Mm -hmm. And he always wanted to people please. And that is sort of, you know, a more complicated story, but that's sort of where it came back to you. But it was that telling the backpacker, no, you need to go and having that boundary and advocating for himself and what he wanted and needed that that then was sort of like the domino that then it snowballed from there, that then it was sending his food back. Then it was saying to friends like, no, I want to go home. I don't want to keep drinking or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it then culminated in the biggest shift of all, which was telling his parents and then feeling their love and support and, and their apologies. And, you know, and then it was, so it's like, I think a lot of times with healing, you think that there's something really small and something really insignificant, but it's actually huge. I remember my therapist Mm -hmm. saying to me, um, uh, it always seems like with your friends, you, you do what they want and you bend over backwards for them. And I was like, obviously, yes, because if I, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not worthy. I don't have value. So yes, obviously I'm going to do whatever works better for other people, you know? And she was like, what would happen if the next time you um, are going to organize a coffee or someone with someone, instead of you driving an hour or whatever to them, what if you met halfway? And my brain was like, wow, I never thought about it like that, you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. which yeah. I look at now, <clears throat> like you were saying of like, I can't imagine the caterpillar life, you know, like I used to be. <laughs> and um, so I was like, yeah, okay. And so I said to my friend when we were organizing coffee, I was like, Hey, what if we meet halfway and we meet on this particular street at that Starbucks? And she was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, Whoa, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> I can ask for what I want and need right. like what? <laughs> and then again, snowball from there of like learning boundaries and learning how to advocate for myself. And, yes. um, yeah. Stop so self healing is, it. yeah. You start can playing a, around with it. Can I have a million dollars. Like, oh, yeah. no, okay. There's, there's the, there's the line. <laughs> yeah. So what would you say? So I, I can see that like in my life and the clients I've worked with, what would you say for you is where like the benefit, right? Cause then like, so for me and in those stories is like resentment, is always the you know red flag telltale yes. sign that there's a boundary violation. So for totally. me, it's like I have more boundaries. I feel less resentful. I just feel happier in my relationships now, and that's you know one of a million things that I've learned in my self healing. Mm -hmm. What is it for you that you would say is like, and the benefit of this is why self healing is rad? Is the uh, you know what would that be for you? It's it's a it's it's a tough one because. I mean, I know the answer, but I, but I'm, I'm also trying to um, feel into what it's like when you're still trying to get your foot onto the path, you know, exactly what you said. It's like when your walls mold down, you realize, oh, wow, we can meet halfway. And then, it, and then the next question is, well, what else is possible? Yes. And it's like, oh, there's a path there now. That's what's, what's, what's finding out. And I think when you just take that first step, people do it in all different sorts of ways, don't they? People do a, mm. they go, oh, I could never jump under a cold shower. And then they have a hot shower and then they do it for five seconds. They go, oh, I just did it. Well, what else is possible now? And I think that's the ultimate question that we're all trying to ask as human beings. At the very end, if now you're on this path of fulfilling your needs and, 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 and actualizing and validating your worth, mm. what's possible now? Like, and I don't want to sell the, the vision to, because I also like, like you, Heidi, I respect what it's like when you just haven't got that foot on the path yet for some, you know, shaved head, bald dude wearing a hoodie going, Hey, what's your kind of potential? You know, that's like, Oh God, here we go. That's, that, that's top of Mount Everest sort of stuff, you know, but that yeah. is kind of the truth. Like when you, when you reach the peak, it's like, what other mountain can I, am I capable mm. of climbing now? Like, mm. what the hell could I do? I could mm. write books. I could travel the world. I could have the most amazing relationship that I never thought possible. Yeah. I could be fitter and healthier or and happier. And there's so much, I mean, the, the, the worst thing imaginable is something akin to Columbine in, in my opinion, where you, you, you kill a whole bunch of innocent people and then you take your own life as well. That's pretty, mm. pretty bad. But what about the other way? Like how good could it get? It's like, well, how much time have you got? You know, so I think that's, that's that, 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 that vision of, you don't know how good your life could be. And that's mm. kind of waiting for you as well. Um, mm. It's just got to, you've got to do that five seconds under the cold shower or ask your friends to meet you halfway, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just taking that first step. That's what I always say to people like mm. humor me. And what if we just try for the next week or until I see you at our next session you just try this wild idea that I have of saying, let's meet halfway. Yes. Or like, let's just have, let's just run the experiment. What's going to happen if I say no, when my friend asks me to do something that I don't really want to do, like, let's just try a couple, a couple of times of, of doing, you know, what it is that I want or what I need. And then, yeah, it's like, then mm -hmm. you have the proof. Um, what would yeah. you say to yeah. someone who's having a hard time in their journey, right? Because yeah. so they're like, okay, 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 I drank the Kool-Aid. I'm with you. I'm like, I'm into therapy or I'm into self-healing, but like, man, I'm stuck or man, I can't shift or man, it just feels like I'm not getting anywhere or I'm still in so much pain. You know, what, what do you say to those kinds of people? So, um, th there's also just one point I'd, I'd love to make as well with, uh, um, getting on the path is, yeah. One, one cool thing that we can do as therapists is like we can set the bar so low to help you begin. It, we're not asking you to 
say no to your mum who's yeah, been dominating yeah. you your whole life. Totally. When, if you're really someone who struggles to say sorry, just and then you pay for everything. This is a client of mine. Say, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot my wallet. I'm not asking you to not say sorry. Just it's all good, but just do something to get you on the path. Where have a one second cold shower. It's all good. You know, mm-hmm. if you're not ready for, for the summit, mm-hmm. let's start with getting you to base camp, you know, so mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big believer in that gradual exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, but having a hard time on the journey, I think for me is, is twofold. It's um, surrounding yourself with people who are also on that journey. I mean, that's massive because it's, oh yeah, we're all doing this together. You don't feel yeah. isolated. You don't feel alone. You can use that other person as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like whatever works for everyone, but um, something that I think is really good about the ANA, AA sort of stuff is um, mentor someone with you, someone who's yeah. walking alongside you. And then also if, if it starts to feel like Groundhog Day, it might be important for you to kind of recalibrate and realign yourself with the the end goal. Mm-hmm. Why are you doing this? You know, what, 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 what where are you headed? Um, I know in my own personal journey, my own experience, um, I'll be, I'll, I'll write a perfect day every three months or so because life changes. You know, I've never really been a big fan of what's my 10 year plan. It's like <laughs> 10 years, totally. like 10 years ago. I was like, <laughs> that's very weird to me. Totally. Yeah, Agreed. But totally. six months, six months to a year, I can be, that's kind of like the, the sweet spot where I can be mm. excited about something that's coming up for me in the future mm. without feeling like it's too easy to get. Um, so too close or, or too far away. So maybe it's time for you to write something down again and go, why am I doing this again? Oh yeah, that, mm. that, that, that is going to be fun. That's going to be really fun. Mm-hmm. So, but the major thing there is, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, really saying anything that we don't know, but it's, it's, you are who you surround yourself with. Mm-hmm. I, that's just so true. It's so true. We now know about mirror neurons, you know, mm-hmm. we really do become who we are surrounded with. And the cool thing about that is that you can now surround yourself with the greatest, most interesting and successful people in the world now if you consume their content. You totally. Know, the, the, there's a lot that we don't like about social media, but if you, it's a very powerful tool, perhaps like a mm-hmm. mushroom. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's powerful. But um, you can use it as a force for good, I think, if, if you're on yeah. that way. So. Yeah, I totally agree. I like that idea of, of you can surround yourself with amazing people even if you don't have them in your everyday real physical life, you can consume their content or when you're scrolling on Instagram or Facebook and you see something that's makes you feel shit about yourself or is depressing or whatever. It's like totally. block that man, like yes. mute them, whatever, unfollow, block that. So that the only stuff that's coming into your feed is good juju and good, you know, vibes and doesn't mm-hmm. make you feel horrible about yourself. You know, I always think about Gary Vee saying stuff like that to his young followers who are like, you know, I have just really negative people in my life. And he's like, listen to me every day, like put on my YouTube videos, like listen to me, rant, read my books, just have those in your ear all day long. And it's totally true. Absolutely true. The stuff that you consume and the stuff that you put in is how you're going to feel and what you get out. And Mm. I think too, with the, um, the feeling stuck thing, sometimes I think what I've noticed in the past is something that's helped me get out of the feeling stuck is realizing that I'm being resistant to something usually. And I think of this analogy of like your two fists pressing towards each other. And if two, you know, boulders are pushing at each other, that is not working. And there's just this resistance, resistance, but as soon as one lays down, it's like, well, then the, it stops. Right. Yeah. And so sometimes when I felt stuck with things, I've noticed the shift is actually me sort of surrendering and going, okay, this is how it is this is what's happening right now. Stop fighting it. You know? So if it's like, um, I'm finding it hard, like say like writer's block, you know, like I'm finding it hard to, to write this thing. I have to write this thing or have this project and I'm finding it hard to get started or whatever. And just every time I sit down, I just, I can't. And then just feeling really tired and then just going, Heidi, stop fighting it. Like, just, just hold on. What is the resistance trying to show you? What is it that you need? Yeah. I need to just lay down. Yes. I actually just need to go have a nap for an hour. And it's yes. like, oh, oh, that's what it was. You know, it's just like, stop fighting, stop fighting, stop saying no, just say yes to whatever it was that you needed. And sometimes that shifting gears. And then I also think the other thing that's helped me mm. is trying something new. 
Yeah. And I always, I have this argument sometimes with parents when um, I see parents in, in session to help with parenting stuff with their kids, if they're sort of resistant or adamant that they know what's best. And um, if I offer an idea and then they shoot it down and, mm. And I'll say like, I'm noticing this resistance to the stuff that I'm offering, which then makes me wonder, why are you here? Because if everything is working in your life, then you wouldn't be here. So you sitting on my couch says to me that there's a part of you that is acknowledging there's something that I'm missing Mm -hmm. and there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to offer you is I think what you think is wrong and what you think needs to be quote unquote fixed is different. Yeah. You think it's this, like you think it's your kid and your kid needs strategies and your kids need to be fixed. I had this conversation with parents yesterday. Um, and I think it's, <laughs> it's you. It's, it's there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, and I was like, dude, it's not your kid. Like he's six. Like <laughs> his brain is not fully developed. <laughs> like he's not, you could give him all the strategies in the world, but like he, he doesn't have the capacity to execute on them. Mm. You do though, because you're 40 and you have a fully developed brain and you have a bank account and you have a car and you have like lots of autonomy in your life. You, on the other hand, if I give you the strategies and tools, you can execute on that. And so, and he was like, um, it was like shift, helping him shift out of strict parenting is just not going to serve you and is just mm. not the way. And uh, it it was, and but I could see the wheels turning in his head of sort of like, yeah, why am I here? If I'm going to shoot down everything Heidi says, maybe I am having problems because I've been doing it this, this way. And so yeah. that's what I always say with like doing my parenting program or doing the artist self-healing program or, you know, work, working with me in therapy or whatever is like, why not just give it a shot, man? Yeah. What do you got to lose? Because obviously stuff is sucking in your life right now yes. and it's not working. Yes. So obviously you're missing something about how to make stuff work. Mm-hmm. So it's like, why not just try it? Try the program for 30 days or 60 days or whatever. And then if you're like, nope, it's all still the same, then like get your money back and be then fine. But like, at least try it because obviously something's not working, you know? Exactly. E- exactly. And I, and, I, and I'm, so this, this is coming to a part now of, of, psychology that is probably most fascinating to me and um and it's so true and i have sympathy for those sorts of people um those sorts of people i myself was one of them yes it, same <laughs> yes the 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 ego you know our sense of self uh... is um it's an interesting thing and i think um what it does when when and this happens in you know as you say um when we talk all the time it's like when that part of your brain isn't on yet you know um the stories about mm. our lives and about other people act as defense mechanisms to um, explain the world, you know? And I think when you start to question someone's stories, strict parenting works. It's like, yeah, but you're here. So, so to you and, I, and to people listening, that's painfully obvious that they're holding on to something that's not true. But yeah. to them, it's like, it's so strong because who would I be without my story? Because this is, and this is why we get addicted to our suffering, because who would we be without it? It's so Literally. terrifying to be us someone else, even yes. though who we are being is so terribly painful. And there's an interesting, I was reading, um, I was reading some studies on depression, um, two authors, Nessie and Williams, um, they, this was a throwaway line, by the way, in one of these studies, and it blew mm. my head off. And I was like, you can't just put that there in the abstract <laughs> and, and pretend like no one noticed. Just drop it there. Yeah. Just drop it there like no one was watching. They said, um, one of the things you find with people who are resistant, depressed, so you have persistent depression, people who are really resistant to treatment, um, is that when they finally let go of a goal that they were holding on to for a long time, their, their depression tends to subside. And to me, what I took away from that was, I believe that our goals define us because who we are is a process of what we do across time. And I'm someone, you know, so if I start doing jujitsu, I become the person doing jujitsu. So my identity shifts just proportionally mm. to that degree. And who I become across time is as a result of what I'm aiming towards. Mm-hmm. So if I let go of this idea of who I need to be, I can then become Mm. someone else. So, and you see that with depression, it's like a personal grief. It's like, oh my God, I'm never going to be a football player or I'm never going to find the right relationship. That's still very much this person is who I need to be. And when if you go, well, maybe there's someone else out there. Maybe I don't need to be a strict parent. Well, now there's potential for you. Totally. 
Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, the, the fact that it's possible, believing yeah. that it's possible for something different. And I, what I always say to parents when they have that resistance or any kind of client that is resistant to that is I'm like, dude, you keep going how you're going. Yes. You keep doing what you're doing. And if you decide you want to try something new, come and see me and then we can try some other things. But it's like, if you're adamant that using the screwdriver on the nail to get it into the wood yeah. is the way to go then like, go baby, go like Enjoy. you, you, you do you like, if yeah. that's what you think is going to work, I've done this for 20 years. And I know that hammers actually work a lot better than screwdrivers. Yeah, right. But if you want to debate with me, the power of a screwdriver in getting the nail, okay, sure. You like, okay. If, if that's what you want to try. But I think what you just told me is you've been trying the screwdriver for the last six years of your kid's life or the last 10 years of your parenting. And it's weird how that nail is still not going in. And yeah. So I'm just trying to offer that I think a hammer is what would help. And the thing that is just, I'm just like, just try it. Yeah. Just try a hammer 10 times and then, and then report back what you find. And, you know, lo and behold, it's always, (laughs) it's in Oh, crazy how the hammer was like so fast and it was so effective. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, Or air tasker, try air tasker. (laughs) Yeah. You can outsource that, man. You don't That's have to right. do it yourself. Delegate, my friend. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your insight. I really appreciate your vulnerability, your honesty, and sharing your journey because I think that, and I hear this from clients all the time. I think it is when you hear someone talk about their caterpillar to butterfly journey, it makes you see it's possible for you. And it makes you see sort of like it pulls the curtain back of going, you know, I didn't just come out like this, this, you know, who I am and how I roll today. You know, it's like the perfect Instagram feed. It's like, that's not real life. You know, like there's been a lot of tears, a lot of therapy, a lot of books that I've had to read to like get to this point. It's been ugly. There's been lots of sweat and tears, but um, I, yeah, I think it's that thing of when you see someone else, you know, it's like the, um, the marathon, like it was something like no one had ever done a four minute mile. Yep. I saw this on a doco, like a Nike thing. And they were like, no one had ever done a four minute mile. And then when someone did it, it was like, what? that's possible. And it's yeah. like, it just got kept getting shorter and shorter. So yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you for taking the time to share and um, be open and honest about your journey. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, it's funny about the, the, mar- the four minute, um, four minute mile was, um, I think three people broke four minutes, like within three weeks after it was first done, you know, and Tony Robbins uses that example. He says, nothing's, everything's impossible until it's possible. Totally. You know? So if you see love someone that doing line. it, it's great. Yes. It's just like, oh yeah, shit, there you go. So yeah. go out there and seek it, find yes. out what's possible. Well, and they exist. It's like, cause I, I can see, I've had clients say to me, but Heidi, you have a lot of privilege, you're white female. And I'm like, yeah, I, I do have a lot of privilege. But there are a million people in the BIPOC community. There's a million people in the LGBTQ community. There's a million people like you can find a person who looks like you, has your background, um, that has got to the top of the mountain, that did the caterpillar journey and is a butterfly. I'm one. You're one. Yeah. But there's you can find you can find that of people who have maybe overcome the same things you've overcome or have, have walked the same path or had the same um, journey for sure. You can find them. Um, if that makes, if that makes you feel more comfortable and makes it feel more believable because it's like, Oh, I can see myself in them rad then do that. Uh, but it, it, that again is a story. I think we tell ourselves is it's like, Oh yeah, that worked for them, but that's not going to work for me. Cause I have this and this and this adversity going. And it's like, bullshit. You can find that person who had the same adversity and has overcome the same stuff as you, you know, they're out there. We don't have to get too political, <laughs> but um, it's it's it, it is that that at what point I think all of us can start to we can feel into when there are true. So if we were recording this podcast in 1950, and a, and a, and a woman was listening to this and saying, "I really want to do this, but um, if I don't wash the dishes appropriately, I'll be hit," and, and and so forth. It's like there's some serious mm. social changes mm. that need to occur there that just. Mm our societies aren't adhering Mm. to, and they still exist today, of course, Mm. but now things are starting to change. Barack Obama was a fantastic president, you know, Mm. Um, Penny Wong, you know, I mean, there's so many, there's so many people out there who come from these disadvantaged positions who now rise to the top. And we're not saying it's not harder, you know, 
But if you really want something now, there are people who are showing you the way. Yes. Whether you listen to people like us or someone Mm, else, you know, there mm. are people in the BIPOC community, as you said, that have Mm. podcasts and do all sorts of things, Mm. but it is there for you. And and listen in, because I feel like we intuitively know this, whether it's a, it's a, it's a truth, it's a, this actually just isn't possible for me unless I rally together and demand social change, Mm -hmm. or it is part of that story that I've been telling myself. Mm. And that story exists for all of us, no matter who we are and what we look like, you know, and that's the part that I'm assuming, I'm, I'm, you know, that you and I are both asking people to, at the very least, just start to reflect upon. Yep. What are the stories I'm telling myself? Yep. hundred Totally. percent. Yep. Thanks dude. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Nice to see you. And um, I will uh, link all of your stuff. Uh, you want to just say really quick where people can find you, your websites and, you know, handles and all that jazz to find you. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, my website has changed very recently. Um, it's Siobhan and Tom Coaching. Um, so this is uh, a business that um, my partner and I have started. Siobhan, just by the way, guys, S-I-O-B-H-A-N. Tom, if you don't know Tom, <laughs> it's all good. But uh, Siobhan Whenever is one I of those. spell it out, I always go Sayo Bahan. <laughs> That's Yes, how I spell exactly. it out in my head. Sayo Bahan. It's ex <laughs> Yeah. that's exactly right. So our business is, is really about helping um, people pleasing anxious women reclaim their power and, and, and use their voice. So people pleasing is, in, you know, something that was very integral to Siobhan's healing anxiety, very much entrenched with OCD that was integral to my healing as well. So we kind of put forces together, but you can find us there. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks, dude.